This one has some boats in it from Lane 2, Tacoma Rowing. Lane 3, Row Growing. Lane 4, Lake Oswego. Lane 5, Vashon. And Lane 6, Eugene. Good times. And our drone is back in the sky. Hooray. And uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a quick test on it to make sure that it's good to go. Um, and isn't going to get drowned in rain. No go. Oh, we've got rain falling at the start. Yes, I see it too. Yeah. Curiouser and curiouser conditions today. We were hopeful. No big deal. Wow. And just look at your picture on that screen, folks. The way that the sun is piercing those clouds uh, from the westward direction. Pretty cool. And you can actually see the rain that's falling uh, from the top right quadrant, quadrant of uh, your screen. Yeah, it's definitely hitting like different parts of the race course. We don't have any rain here at the finish, uh, but it definitely, you can see it kind of squalling over there by the start. So. Yeah, and just looking at uh, at this down the course here, I'm going to give lanes three and four here. Uh, Rogue Rowing and Lake Oswego the lead at this time. Again, it's very tough to say from about a thousand meters away, but um, if I pull up my little eagle eyes here, it's looking like Rogue and Lake Oswego in lanes three and four. So we will keep an eye on this as they make their way down the course. Again, two different weather systems going on here, one at the starting line, one at the finish line. So um, again, you can even see it if you just look up at these cloud formations too, where the rain is kind of blowing. So luckily though, we still have very, very nice water coming into the second half of this race, which will give these novice quads uh, some really nice racing towards the finish line. Yeah, most definitely. Um, I heard someone say earlier that we actually have a stratified microclimate here. Uh, we were talking about some meteorolo meteorology in the uh, volunteer tent and um, someone brought up that this is a microclimate that is broken into kind of tiny bits. Um, so it's kind of cool. And usually the microclimate works in our favor, but occasionally we do get Weird little pockets of rain that's uh, keeping our drone grounded right now. So Well, you know, there's a reason it's so green here. Indeed, yeah. You get a lot of rain. With the beauty comes the rain. Indeed. That's right. So as we look down the course again, see if I can give you anything a little bit more specific. But still, it's looking like, yeah, our third and fourth place uh, third and fourth lanes here. So Lake Oswego, potentially Vashon Island has moved up a little bit. I do see those teal blades kind of creeping forward a little bit. Well, Rogue Rowing looks like they have slipped back just a little bit. Again, not too much. It's hard to say exactly how much now, but they haven't fallen back that much. Vashon Island, though, uh, going to keep a very close eye on them, led by Emily Rock in lane five. Those lovely teal blades, again, moving up just a little bit on Lake Oswego, led by Anne Benincasa. So we're going to keep an eye on those two as our current leaders, but again, it's not over until it's over. And then in that third place position, I'm going to move over to lane two, Tacoma, followed very, very closely by Eugene and Rogue. And again, worth noting that this is Tacoma's first ever time at the Northwest Regional Youth Championship Regatta. Brand new program out of Tacoma Rowing that we are so excited to have with us today. Five races left in the day uh, after this race concludes. We have five more races coming at you. We'll be racing, it looks like through about 5.30 today on the schedule. And... Uh, while our drone is down, Whitney has her binoculars glued to her eyes, trying to give you some calls. It's a little bit tough, but I think that they're approaching the pylons and uh, our visual acuity um, is almost here to be able to give you an idea of who's winning this race. Yeah, that's right. And I still have to give it to Lake Oswego, followed very closely by Vashon. But again, this could be anybody's game as we come up to the red buoys in the last 500. Um, this is a very, very tight race between these two for sure, and we cannot overlook here lane one, actually lane two, our first boat here because we are missing lane one, so lane two, but our first boat, Tacoma Rowing, followed by Eugene and then Rogue A. So again, our leaders still Lake Oswego and Vashon Island, but 
I think we are already getting these coxswains staring each other down. We have the Vashon Island coxswain sitting up very, very tall, um, encouraging her crew on as they come up to the red buoys here on about this stroke here. There we go. Into the red buoys now. Here we go. It will be a showdown between Vashon and Lake Oswego. Keep an eye out for these two crews in the lead. It's really nice, too. We talked about steering a little bit um, in some of these quads where a lot of times in a quad, the, the athletes have to steer with a little toe mechanism, uh, which can be very tricky. So you will move your toe one direction or the other to actually steer the boat. But here they are lucky enough to have a coxswain to do the steering for them. And I have to say, I have been very, very impressed with how these coxswains are steering yeah. down the course. It has really been nice to see a lot of these coxswains are either well-trained by their coaches, which is rare. You don't often see a lot of coaches that know how to coach coxswains, um, or they get a lot of practice. And so they have to practice going in a straight line, which can sometimes be a little bit more difficult than uh, going around some turns. Yeah. Fun inter fact. Interestingly, Whitney, uh, a lot of the teams here actually have designated coxswain coaches who work exclusively with the coxswains. And I know that there are at least two of these coxswain coaches that work with multiple programs. Wow, this is a that close is race. That's great to see. Yep. Coming in. You wow. You saw it here first. Yeah, I think that was Vashon. Vashon. Yeah. I think got that. Absolutely. Just a hair, a yeah. bow ball perhaps, over Lake Oswego. But again, we will check our official timing here. And again, very closely behind them, just seconds behind here, lane... Th trying to see, this is lane three here. Rogue Rowing, who was able to overtake lane six, Eugene. So Rogue did move ahead of Eugene to finish in that third place position. Yeah, well done them. And I really appreciate you calling out the, the coxswain proficiency here because uh, about four years ago, I started noticing programs investing more into getting former coxswains uh, aligned just for the purpose of coaching coxswains on their youth teams. And it made such a big difference. Um, I noticed the two teams that I worked with where I saw uh, coxswain coaches being utilized specifically um, you just saw the coxswains get a lot more confidence more quickly and a lot more awareness and really having a mentor that has been exclusively in that coxswain seat, teaching you what you need to know, I think is invaluable for anybody that wants to step into that role. And I hope that more youth programs can invest in such wonderful, wonderful opportunities for their coxswains to grow. Right. And as we have Tacoma finishing up on the outside here, so let's give a big hand to Tacoma, yeah, Tacoma. on the outside. But yes, you are absolutely right. The position of a coxswain is very tricky because you play so many roles. You, mm. you are part of the team, but you are also a leader on the team. Mm -hmm. And it adds some complications sometimes if you're a woman on a men's team or uh, a man yeah. on a woman's team. Totally. So there are many dynamics that come into play there. And to balance all of them can sometimes be tricky because you would manage one role one way where you might manage another role another way but you're the same mm. person so you have to manage the whole problem the whole plate of problems or issues or whatever comes up as one person and one mm. role but be many things to many people so it's it's really a balancing act of mm -hmm. being a confident leader but also a team player mm -hmm. so it can be very tricky so it's it's a lot to manage when you're trying to just figure it out while also learning how to row if you are a younger a uh, younger coxswain coming up and becoming a student of the sport. So yeah. um, while you're trying to execute being a good coxswain, you are mm -hmm. also simultaneously learning what coxing is. Yeah. And that's very, very tricky. It's very complicated. A lot of coaches do not know how to coach that. Mm. So they kind of just leave them to figure it out. So yeah. I love to hear that they're investing in that because yeah. it's, it's absolutely crucial mm -hmm. uh, to the importance of a team. So well, most coaches were not coxswains. Most coaches that I've experienced are were rowers and, and so don't have any experience on how to deliver the coxing. They know how to receive the coxing and that's kind of a different thing. Um, and so, yeah, I've seen a lot of maybe missteps uh, with former rowers who are now coaches trying to, to deliver the sauce to their co coxswains, but just falling a little bit short because there, there's a difference in, in that practice. And coxswains are so easy to blame too for mm. a lot of problems. It really, it becomes a problem. It shouldn't be blamed, you know, mm -hmm. unless a coxswain isn't steering straight or, you know, has made a, make, uh, made a mistake and, and we will. You know, yeah. the, the only way to become good at coxing is to be thrown in the fire. Yeah. That is yeah. the only way to do it. So, yeah. 
Uh, you have to get in there. You have to make mistakes. You have to say weird things. You have to, you know, not steer perfectly straight for a while and figure it out. And each mm -hmm. boat has a little bit of a different personality. So you have to oh, learn yeah. how to steer different boats. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Even across eights. You know, across yeah. eights, each boat has a different response time. Mm -hmm. uh, you get those, uh, those rudders down there that are the size of a credit card and you're steering a 60 to 63 foot boat and mm. it takes a little response time. And, yeah. you know, there's a huge learning curve. Totally, yeah. So, and there's there's really a lot to a lot to put into practice there. Yeah, I feel as though you you could definitely teach a master class on sculling or on, on coxing. I just learned a lot from from what you just shared. And uh, uh, so Whitney and I have actually been corresponding about uh, commentating, and I've learned so much about how to be an effective commentator uh, through that correspondence that I'm just going to go ahead and, and pitch that Whitney should just teach coxing clinics and and up the the coxing standard across the world. Well, you heard it here first, so slide <laughs> into my DMs if you would like. Uh, any Cox and clinics, I travel and I'm happy to do that for you. And I have certainly learned a lot about uh, beats and how to keep the mood light and um, how to report the weather. That is for sure. Uh, from a man who lives it daily in this environment, I am from sunny Southern California. So this is not stuff that I get too often. So this is a pleasure for me to be somewhere else. I miss my calling as a beatboxing weatherman. That is, that is definitely true. Well, you know, it's never too late, right? Got to live that dream. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And uh, speaking I think we the of next, dreams. Yeah, the next race is on the course. Field of dreams. Yeah. Right. If you build oh. it, they will come. Kevin and here, Costner is smiling down on us from afar. That's right. And look <laughs> at the weather has calmed down. It's absolutely perfect out here. Hallelujah. And I think we have our second final of the women's quad now coming down the course. Yeah. Would you like to hear about the boats that are about to appear? I would love to hear I about would, the boats. I would love to tell you about these boats. Let me tell you what. We got an awesome boat in lane two from Seattle Prep. In lane three, we've got a divine looking boat from Olympia Area Rowing. In uh, lane four, Sammamish is rocking the block with their B squad. And in lane five, Eastside Prep A is showing up to show us what's what. And finally, in lane six, Holy Names is showing up to put the other teams to shame. We'll see how they do with that. It's, uh, it's getting to be some fun times in the afternoon. We've got, I think, four more races for you, and we are, we're are we counting it down with chagrin because this is honestly my favorite weekend of the, of the year, and I love this community. I love all of our volunteers. I think that the rowing in the Northwest is some of the most beautiful by, uh, by way of venues that I've seen, and uh, I just think it's something really special up here. So I'm so glad that we can welcome Whitney to our shores. This is her first time at Vancouver Lake, uh, hopefully not the last, um, but it is really exciting as we wrap up our first day of broadcast for the Northwest Regional Youth Championship Regatta today. Yeah, well, thank you for the warm welcome. Certainly not the warm weather, but <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here. This is one of my favorite parts of the country, so it is an absolute honor to be here. Um, speaking of some of these crews that we see coming down the course here, Holy Names, just want to point out that they have had uh, at Windermere, the Brentwood International and uh, the Northwest Champs last year have a significant amount of accolades to their names. So I do want to kind of keep an eye on that Holy Names crew again again, just across the board, they have shown up again and again and again. So when I see this name pop up, my ears perk up instantly when I hear holy names. So as we start to move into a few strokes here, it looks like we're just shy of the 500 to go. So in the thick of the third 500, I'm going to see if I can get some better eyes on uh, better visuals here on some placements, but again, a little bit difficult for us to see from this far away without our drone, but we're going to do our best here. So we have what looks like. Yeah, still tough to tell. Yeah, it is very yeah. tough to tell from this angle here. Not as big of a spread as we've seen in some of the other races. Yeah. So a little bit tough to see, but could potentially be east side prep. Is that east side prep in the neon? Again, my apologies until they just get a little bit closer. Oh, and now we've got some drone angle on I it. I don't want to speculate too, too much, but yeah. here we go. This helps us so much. This is why we never take our drone for granted. Yeah. With our cinematic. Thank you, Brian, for putting that back in the air. Absolutely. Yeah. Gives us a much better view of the field. We can be a little bit more accurate for you. Yep. Five o'clock and all is well. And it looks like we've got a pretty intense race unfolding for the medals up here. Um, I think at the top of your screen, we're seeing holy names. Um, 
Okay, and I think lane two there, Olympia is uh is just barely holding a lead. Barely, barely, barely. Yeah, so I think that was East Side in the neon there. So we have Olympia and East Side okay. as our leaders. Ooh, as we swoop down for this gorgeous side shot here. Yeah. Beautiful. Sandwiching Sammamish. Wow, this is a tight race, though. They are neck and neck against Sammamish there. Yeah, that really is the second final. Some of these women are going to have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, maybe. They're yeah. racing for pride here and really want to throw down and execute a great race. You could not ask for better conditions as we come down the course here, but we have to look on the outside. Look at Holy Names making this charge. Or I'm sorry, Eastside. East side, yeah, Eastside. East side, just East side in the neon. Uh, they blended in just a moment there totally. into the into the gray, but here they are. I think they might actually have one East or one Holy Names uh, set of oars for Stroke Seat. Um, I think that there has been some some blade sharing this weekend, which is awesome, and we, we love to see cooperation. Seen some blade sharing, absolutely. Um, but but we, it but it confuses me because I'm easily confused. I'm a simple man. I like rowing. I like blades That's on the right. water. Well, we are <laughs> looking at a very very tight race here. Yeah. I'm going to give it lane two. That is Seattle Prep. Yeah, in but the lead, followed by three and five. So that is Olympia and Eastside. I don't think Eastside's done. I think Eastside's starting to charge. I think they're bringing their sprint into full force now, and I think they're starting to walk. Oh, you are absolutely right. Here oh, we go. Yeah, wow. lane five. That is Eastside really, yeah. really going for it here. Blades in the water. Prep is trying to respond, but I just don't think they have the juice. Wow, Eastside just brought it up enough. and walked. Yep. Yeah. Eastside. Wow, Taking that was. That second place Whoa. finish. Followed by lane three, Olympia. Holy smokes, folks. That was so exciting from Eastside. Um, you know, they could have faded. They could have not really pushed that, that extra uh, envelope, but they did, and it paid off for them, and they took the V. Very exciting race for prep there, too. Very well rowed, very clean all the way through. Really nice blade work, too, for a novice quad. Um, mm -hmm. Very, very impressive. Yeah. Um, getting those blades in and keeping the boat moving again between strokes and letting the boat actually do the work for them. And that, again, I think takes a lot of maturity. Uh, it takes a little bit of time in the boat to actually figure out what that feels like. Yeah. To let the boat do the work for you. After you drive away, you get your legs through, uh, through the drive there and get your blades through the water. Um, it takes a lot of maturity a lot of time to actually be patient mm. on the way up and let mm -hmm. the boat do that work for you. Yeah, so here, is just crossing the line here now. Right. Speaking of patience, uh, lane four, we have been patiently awaiting Sammamish crossing the course here, the, the uh, finish line, excuse me, followed by lane six. Holy names. Holy names. Way to go, holy names. Way to round out the field here. Yeah. Oh, speaking of those uh, Vespoli black shells, I think that that is one of the first uh, generation Vespoli uh, bow, uh, bow coxed fours. Oh, that's right. The, there those you M2s. Go. The boat yeah. Named Susanna. Nice. Holy names. Yeah. The, the technology of rowing is something that I find keenly fascinating. I think uh, by virtue of, of having studied a little bit of George Pocock's work, but also his son, Stan Pocock, who was uh, one of the pioneers in uh, getting composite materials and moving away from wooden boats. Um, so there's a lot of really cool stuff that's happened in the Northwest by way of rowing technology. And George Pocock's red cedar shells were the fastest in the world for a long time. Um, so really cool tradition here on rowing and the history of the technological developments of our sport here, um, including actually some really valuable contributions on the tech side. Um, some of our regatta timing uh, sites are actually uh, originally from Seattle and, uh, and Portland. So it's really cool that uh, the tech component of the work that we do um, comes from this region as well. And right now riding along with another race, we've got the third final for the Women's Novice Cox Quad event. And... Um, would you like to give us the lanes, or would or would you prefer that I do so? I want to oh, share. Uh, I want to share the the joy oh, that we get from that. Thank you. I would love nothing more <laughs> to get through this here. The women's novice quad third final in lane two, Vancouver Lake Rowing Club, lane three, Seattle Prep, lane four, Bainbridge, lane five, Pocock B, and lane six, Pocock A. So again, do not be fooled by the A and the B boats here. We never know what they're labeled. They could be boats that are broken up into smaller boats or ones that break up into uh, doubles or singles or other boats like that. So uh, we never know which one is actually the A versus the B boat yeah. until we get through some of this race here. So yeah. 
right now, um, it is looking to me like Seattle prep. Yeah, handily. That's right. Yeah. Led here again by Lily Ward here. So Lily Ward stroking. Let's see if I can get a stroke rate on Lily Ward there from Seattle prep. I like that you're doing the official stroke rates with technology because I typically just eyeball it. So if I told you that I thought they were mobbing at a 28 to 30 right now, is that accurate? Uh, no. Actually, what, what I have them at a 34. Wow, I was way off. Well, it's okay. It can be deceiving. And you know what? Yeah. That's a great example of yeah. what we're seeing right here because yeah. they are making a higher stroke rate look different. They are. And for a novice crew, they're rowing really smooth with their sculling. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It takes a very poised crew here yeah. to actually make a higher stroke rate look like a lower stroke rate to yeah. make it look easy. And they have a lot of finesse here. We are looking yeah. at a crew with a lot of finesse and you will see it now on the horizon, nearly a horizon in front of the rest of the field, a phenomenal Formidable performance by Seattle Prep, again, led by stroke seat Lily Ward and the coxswain here. So Lily getting a first-hand view of the rest of the competition there as they come down the chutes through the red buoys. Yeah, the only thing I would say about this prep crew is that they are missing a little bit of water, particularly bow and two seat. You can see that they reach maximum compression and get squeezed all the way up at the top, but then they're just kind of hanging out. And so maybe kind of retiming the recovery to get up to the catch uh, at the same time as bow and three seat, or stroke and three seat. Be the only right. thing that I would say they could do better, but as a novice crew, just to have that one critique is uh, astounding and, and right. they're really impressing me right now. Exactly, exactly. And it's kind of one of those things where once you feel it, you know what mm. it feels like so you can replicate it. But mm -hmm. until you actually know what it feels like to connect with the boat as you're sliding forward to the catch, yeah. uh, to keep that boat moving, once you once you know what it feels like, you can replicate it. But it takes a little bit of time in a boat to really get that. Definitely. But Whatever they're doing now is absolutely working for them because yeah. the Seattle Prep crew once again yeah. has crossed the line in first. So very exciting finish there um, I, in the final, uh, final, final yeah. of the <laughs> women's novice quad here. Very exciting. And let's see. I think I see big things on the horizon for Seattle Prep based on the results that we've seen this weekend already. I think that Seattle Prep has a really big incoming class of freshmen and sophomores that are poised to do great things in their junior and senior years to come. Absolutely so, here. And yeah. in lane four, Bainbridge Island coming down the course in the Optimus Prime. <laughs> I love uh, that. You love to see it. <laughs> see if it transforms in the end. Auto something completely assemble. different. Auto boats assemble, perhaps. Oh, that's a good one. Oh, ho, ho. for the win. That's right. For the silver. And then coming into third here, right after Optimus Prime, we have lane five, Pocock B. Pocock B will be followed by lane two, which is Vancouver Lake Rowing Club, followed by lane six. Pocock A. So again, that's why we never say which boat is actually, uh, you know, going to come in first if we have an A and a B boat, because you just never know on the day or how they've been split up. And if you look across here, we have a beautiful rainbow uh, finishing up this beautiful view as we watch the Whoa. end of this race here. That really, is a thick rainbow, you might say. Really spectacular. That's one of the fattest rainbows I've seen in a while. It is. It's girthy, even. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Some real nice violets off of that. You don't typically see uh, the violet so pronounced, but it's like the violet side of the rainbow, or indigo, I think is what it officially is. Roy G. Biv, no, violet. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're right. It's kind of shattered in the clouds there. And the rainbow shines here, right, as lane two, Vancouver Lake Rowing Club. 